Okay, perfect. So, um, like I previously mentioned, there's a little bit of a shift in the agenda. Uh, we're going to uh, pass over Alex Sherman for right now, and then we're going to hand it off to Jen Keller and Chris Joseph, and they're going to talk about PT and the benefits of exercise. I guess, um, well, thank you very much for having us today. Uh, we're both physical therapists at the Kennedy Krieger Institute, and uh, um, we, it seems to be perfect to follow Ben talking today about um, exercise and physical therapy and the benefits. Um, I think, oh, let's see, I did something wrong already. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think I've been working in the Center for Movement Studies at Kennedy now for um, a little over 15 years. And during that time, I've worked with um, people with AMN in the Lorenzo Zoyle study and also in a more recent study for women. Uh, with AMN where we had them exercise uh, three times a week for 12 weeks and we compared their uh, performance to uh, women without AMN. And what our studies have shown in this time is um, all of the of all the impairments that um, affect uh, adults with AMN, uh, weakness is the most prevalent feature affecting movement. So we've looked at sensation and strength, um, and we've uh, looked at balance and walking. And uh, when we uh, look at a large group of people, we see that weakness is the thing that most affects people's walking ability. And so um, what we also find is that it not only affects men, but it affects women as well. Um, and that it's on a spectrum, person to person, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, in addition to that, though, it is changeable. And um, what we have found most recently is that if we um, improve strength, we can also improve walking ability. And so what we wanted to kind of tell you about today was rather than um, the details of the results of the exercise studies, but more just about things that you might be able to do now. And um, for one thing, uh, there are a lot of from, for physical activity. Um, obviously, you can strengthen your, your muscles. Um, it can increase your energy. It can help you do uh, daily activities, which is really important, and prevent falls, which can be very costly. Um, it can reduce pain, uh, improve your sleep, um, help with stress and mood, and reduce symptoms of aging, which AMN is um, a symptom of aging in some ways that we are getting older. Uh, symptoms develop, and so you have to deal with both the um, symptoms of get, of getting older as well as the symptoms of AMN. Um, in the, the world of physical therapy, there's a new campaign called uh, Choose PT, and so I took this from their website of the Physical Therapy Association, but um, it would give some very good points about why PT is a good place to start for uh, uh, participation in physical activity. Um, Therapists have a, a broad medical uh, knowledge of conditions, um, a lot about safe and, uh, and various physical activities, um, and they can treat people with a number of different medical conditions as well as healthy people. Um, and I think in the world of AMN, since there's such a large spectrum of um, weakness and mobility, that uh, that's the one way in which physical therapists can be very helpful in um, addressing the the problems across the spectrum of, of disability or changes that you have, and as you change over time. So modifying programs to uh, make, meet the needs uh, as the disease uh, changes. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to Chris now to continue. So I'm, I'm Christopher Joseph. I, I take what Jen uh, learns in the lab and I try to apply that clinically to the, to the clinic. Um, so these are the kind of things that we um, find work really well for both males and females with uh, uh, adrenal leukodystrophy. dystrophy. So progressive resisted training, as Jen talked about already, um, uh, circuit training, uh, balance training we're, we're working on, adaptive recreation, um, treadmill training, aquatic therapy. This is one that um, we really talk about in the clinic a lot. Hippotherapy, for those of you who don't know, that's horseback riding. So you can actually apply therapy during the activity of horseback riding, which is really beneficial. Um, the kids really love that one as well. Um, uh, neuromuscular uh, electrical stimulation as well as functional electrical stimulation. We can apply those. Those probably have the same features, but we're going to talk more about functional electrical stimulation. Taping, um, that's a kinesio taping for those of you who've dealt with therapy already. That's the application of the tape in the direction of a muscle pull to assist with uh, your muscle function. Uh, body weight support treadmill training. I'm going to talk about um, more of the splinting and stretching uh, as, as it applies to Botox and also alternative therapies for massage and ac acupuncture and stuff like that. Um, 
So just uh, in general, I'm going to start off by talking about functional electrical stimulation, but this also applies to uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulation. But we, we really hope to supplement movements that aren't occurring already with the, with the device when we use this. We want to counteract any abnormal movements. So um, classic we see with some of the adults with AMN is that spasticity is going in the opposite direction that you want to move and is resisting your movement. So we're using the FES to kind of help that, uh, improve that movement. Um, strengthens, you know, people think of the FES as, as an application, but it's also a strengthening device. It, it applies the contracture to those uh, large muscle fibers and helps to strengthen those muscles. And there's new evidence that even we can actually, in some um, early stages of stroke, as well as some of the pediatric evidence shows that we can tap into the neuroplasticity using FES and retrain your brain so you learn to move better by uh, applying the contraction in the right direction. So um, the devices we use in the clinic uh, in general that, that apply them functionally are the foot drop devices like the walk aid and the Bioness. And Bioness has, has a thigh cuff that also gets a knee contraction as well. But the application of the device can be used you know, just for general strengthening as well. It doesn't have to be applied to a function. And I'm not sure if my, OK, well, next one first. Um, so, you know, the, the, the most frequent application for these devices is on the dorsiflexors, which, you know, that's a muscle that, that lifts your foot up and clears your toe when you walk. So, you know, most people with the adult symptoms, you know, uh, um, talk about the impairment of a toe drag or catching their feet on things. So this device helps with that, lifting the toe and clearing the toe. Um, but we also at times want to apply it to the plantar flexors, which is the back muscle, which actually points your toe. Um, and we'll do that when you're losing stance. If you're more crouching or bending down when you're walking, we can apply the FES to the back of the calf to straighten you up a little better. Um, most, people think, most people think that the knee extensor or the thigh is actually what straightens your knee during stance, but it's actually your calf muscle. Actually, when you step down, it's your active plantar flexion or you're pushing in that calf muscle that causes that knee to extend. So we can apply it there. So this video may not run, but if you can see the device, um, this is both the foot drop. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, Let's see if it plays. It may not play. Um, just so I'll explain it since it's not uh, playing right now, but there's a, oh, can we go back? There we go. Um, so the device is actually applied to the, uh, to the lower device on the calf actually uh, is applied to the anterior tib muscles, the front muscle that lifts your foot up. Um, it used to be on a wireless foot sensor on the bottom, that little thing by the ankle, but now they've actually redone the device and it's an accelerometer, so the foot switch is gone. And then it works with the thigh cuff up top, which, which actually straightens your knee. So basically the device lifts your foot up in a swing and straightens your knee out for you during the end of stance. And, that apply, and you can apply those movements while you're walking. Um, if we could show the video, it would actually show that, um, but uh, it's not working at this point right here. Um, so we have a, uh, some good success with this, and this is an example of an adult male who's 40 years old who, when he first came into us, could not lift his uh, right foot at all. Um, so we did, and he really walked slowly uh, due to his gait, um, had no active movement. Again, this dorsiflexion is on the right at baseline. After one year of using the device, he now had, he had, could apply 33 pounds of force on his right foot by lifting his right foot up, but, and actually lost uh, function on his left. So we actually went about and got him a second BioNest device for his left side to actually strengthen that. So the device not only gave him the movement he needed, but it also strengthened him along the way, which is really nice. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about range of motion. We see a lot of issues with range of motion in the clinic. Um, and they're not always from, they're, they're from two, two possible reasons that we see the problem with range of motion in the foot, the foot and the ankle, mostly in the foot and the ankles, is it due to spasticity. So again, you're trying to lift that foot up and that spastic muscle in your calf is trying to push your foot back down at the same time. Um, or that is a result of, of a long-term weakness or the spasticity, you have a, 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 an impairment there. This, this, this lack of range of motion impacts your, uh, your balance. Um, so your foot's less adaptive when you put it on the ground. You actually can catch your toe, we've had this before, and can have frequent falls. Um, tripping, toe clearance, or also and, and stair ambulation is an issue. So we typically have patients come into the, to the clinic and they think that they have weakness and that's why they can't lift their toe up. But we actually see with them is they actually have tight calf muscles and contractures. And then one of the devices we apply to, to, to that is they'll, they'll, if they have spasticity that warrants uh, Botox, they'll come in for Botox injections to reduce the spasticity in that calf muscle. And then we'll apply some serial casting or some long-term splinting to their calf to give them the range of motion back. And once they get the range of motion back, then they're able to clear their toe better. So it just speaks to the fact that not every time you cut your toe, you're, it's a weakness. It could be a contraction that occurs, and we see that quite frequently. People let 
themselves go and catch their toes for long periods of time and don't realize that they're causing a shortness in the muscle in their calf. So I, it just, I would just like to speak to the fact that if you start to feel that way you know, and you don't see a physical therapist or you don't, haven't talk, told your provider about that, get that addressed earlier so you're not to the point of the contracture and you need the casting or the, or the long-term splinting. Um, so we measure activity level in the clinic in, in two main ways. There's a, a six-minute walk test and a 25-foot functional walk. Um, and there's a direct relationship between physical activity and functional ability. So as you increase your physical activity, you know, in, in uh, some of our your functional ability test goes up. You know, keeping physically active is ver very important for, for being functional in it. And the focus, you really need to see, talk to your physical therapist about this, your, fo your focus on your, on your, your uh, exercise program around your, your, uh, what your evaluation speaks to, what your weakness areas are. So, um, and it's just relevant in uh, um, you know, some of our cases. These are two cases of, of women we had for the clinic, and they've actually increased their six-minute walk test by 25% you know, by applying exercise. Uh, the first case is a female who's uh, 53 years old who is, uh, has, does moderate exercise three days a week that are focused in her exercise, uh, around the exercise program that we gave her in the clinic. She increased her six-minute walk from 420 meters to 526 meters, and she was she was totally amazed when she came in and saw that. Um, and then there was a 52-year-old female, so case number two, who uses a rolling walker mainly for, for and a wheelchair for longer distances. She does three three days a week of moderate exercise in the pool, and she does she increased her walk by 26 percent. She went from 170 meters to 220. Just speaks to the fact that exercise is really important and focused in the area of, of where you want to you know, where your weaknesses are. So. So generally what we say about uh, exercise is you really do need a comprehensive baseline PT evaluation. You want some strength testing, you want range of motion testing and walking speed, um, balance sensation, and then cardiovascular endurance. You want to establish uh, an initial exercise program based on the results of this evaluation. Um, and you want to find local resources. So you, know, you don't need to see a PT to exercise, but somebody who understands exercise can work with a PT in the clinic uh, to, find, to, to really find that exercise. Uh, excellent program. And again, back to Jen's question about find a PT. And I think Jen's going to talk to the next section here. So yeah, so um, on the APTA website, that was just up there, uh, they do have a link called find a PT where you can um, type in your area code, I mean your uh, zip code, and you can also um, type in like what you're looking for. So typically, I think we suggest with people, for people with AMN, you could look for someone who treats people with uh, multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury. Um, you know, uh, orthopedic therapists are fantastic exercise, um, at exercise programs, but um, they're not as familiar with the neurological uh, aspect. And so finding someone that has uh, both, both, I think, uh, can really help fine tune your uh, exercise program. Um, so I was just going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, a progressive resistance training program that we completed recently for people with multiple sclerosis, where we looked at um, 30 people with MS and 30 uh, healthy controls, and we had them train three uh, times a week for 12 weeks um, in the clinic um, doing a progressive resistance training program using uh, resistance bands. Um, and then they also did one exercise on the weekends at home, and they logged their uh, frequency and effort of, uh, with the program. In addition to the actual strengthening, um, or I guess the focus of the strengthening program was actually on isolated muscle strengthening. So um, I tend to think about uh, gyms being where you have a piece of equipment and you can um, uh, say your knee is bent, uh, uh, straighten it. You can use other muscles than just your quadricep muscle that you intend to use to be strengthening. And I th uh, we tend to use the ones that are strong and so they get stronger and the ones that are weak don't aren't getting the effort that you want. And so we designed this program to specifically target the muscles that are weak at the hips, which um, are a problem for uh, AMN as well as MS, um, and, it, and they're very important in your walking ability. And we, um, in particular, they look like they're easy, simple exercises, but we um, put them in a alignment for the way that you use them when you walk, so uh, that they would get stronger, and particularly in the position that is important for improving walking. So I'm going to get into the details of that, but. Um, we also incorporated a functional exercise, such as like going from sit to stand, um, so that in the activity program you would have a chance to strengthen your, uh, say, your hip, um, 
hip flexor, and then you would do an, ac an activity like marching or climbing stairs where you would use that muscle and you would, could be able to um, get a better feeling of, of when, you need, when you use that muscle more functionally and see translation into your daily activities. Um, in addition to that, we did some balance activities. So in particular, um, I'll talk about the gluteus medius, which is the muscle on the side of your hip. It's very important for balance, for maintaining your balance. When you pick up one leg and stand on that leg, you need, you need that muscle to help your, with your stability. And um, so we also, after doing strengthening exercises for that muscle, worked on balance activities in particular, so that in the same way with sit to stand or, or something, you would uh, be able to translate the use of the st stronger muscle into activities. Um, and then uh, what I think is a really big feature of uh, the most uh, research uh, exercise studies is that um, it is super important at how hard you work. And um, there's a target range. Uh, we usually say in that four to six range where it, you're just starting to feel like it's hard or it is hard. Um, if you are working in a too easy range, you're not uh, stressing your body enough to see improvement. If you're working at a too hard of a range, um, uh, your body won't have enough time to recover or you may risk some injury. So any exercise you do, whether it's balance, strengthening, or something else, you want to be thinking about how hard is this activity um, and to, in order to ensure that you're making some improvements. So um, this exercise study that I'm about, we recently published it in the Jove Journal, which is a video journal. It's pretty interesting, but it's a way in order to um, make studies more uniform and make sure that people really learn what it is that you do and they can carry it over. Um, for me personally, I think it's important in order to hopefully transition something like this to the community. It provides a means for uh, trainers and other therapists to learn the method that we designed to do this, and it's really cheap. <laughs> so that makes it nice nice too, it makes it possible to do it in a number of different ways, and cost isn't as much of a, of a factor. So I'll just show you a little, it was kind of uh, fun. I, this, is, this part, um, I'm just going to play, but um, we showed how we measured strength using a dynamometer, um, and in that way, it's a good way to train physical therapists and people in the community in how to measure your strength quantitatively with a number, rather than normally you think about somebody pushing on your arm or your leg to get a, just a rough estimate of how strong you are, but this would let us measure um, an improvement in strength. Um, uh, yeah, so it's this little disc and uh, you resist as uh, we pull in the opposite direction of the muscle. And we would always do two tests in order to get uh, an average consistent measure. There is some error in it, about five pounds. So we need to see a change of at least that much to know that you've made an improvement. Um, so we, so after, uh, so the, the other thing that we do is we show in detail the setup of the exercises, um, how pe we gave people an exercise log. Um, you can get the exercise log online with the, with the, uh, with the video. Um, it shows uh, where you can write down how many, uh, how many bands you're using, how short they are. Uh, we actually found these, um, these uh, straps at Home Depot, so for much cheaper than the exercise equipment, if you want to hang stuff in your garage, <laughs> you can also find um, a uh, band that fits around your thigh. It has a hook, and you can hook a carabiner to it. Um, and then on the low-tech way, what we did was tied knots every eight inches in the TheraBand and put in little zip ties in order to uh, make sure that you could be a little more uh, systematic about improving or, or uh, making your resistance higher. Um, now, it, now uh, I think it's their band. Uh, I think they took our idea and they started putting loops in their bands already. So you know, don't have to go ahead and tie it. But they are more expensive, so uh, so you can always go back to the cheap method. Um, and, and if you go back, so that so that when you put that loop in there, it actually shortens the band, which that actually adds more resistance. That's the way it makes it resist. Um, so this is what it looks like. We had five different colors. Um, although I guess there's just four here. Um, oh, there's five, okay. And uh, we tied those every eight inches. And then depending on, the one thing you have to know is like where, how you set it up, you know, where do you put, where do you put the thigh cuff or the ankle cuff? How do you attach it to the right location? And so uh, luckily at the time of this uh, study, I guess it's not here yet, uh, we had an artist in the lab. So she uh, drew us some really great pictures and that identifies all of these uh, specific points for doing the exercises. But, First, I'll show you just the results from the study. So, 
uh, there was criticism that we might not see change in 12 weeks, but we actually saw significant change in eight weeks in uh, the people with MS. And so that's really nice because for one thing, you wanna know how long you have to exercise for in order to see an improvement, right? You, uh, it's easy to get, you know, kind of uh, exercise fatigue when you're thinking about like, I've been exercising, exercise, I don't see any difference. So you kind of wanna know how long do I really have to be working at this before I'm gonna see something significant improve um, so that you either don't give up too soon and, and you make you know make the effort last. In addition to that, we saw improvement in people who had asymmetry. The, this one you can see that some, uh, the, the group, uh, I guess this is an individual, improved on their weaker side. Um, you know, we might we didn't know we, we don't always know with MS or an AMN like if your weaker side has too much impairment to improve. But even with our curve study, we saw both sides uh, show some improvement. So. Um, I can go into detail some of the exercises that we did in this study if you're interested. I don't know where we are on time. Um, so I can select a couple and talk about those or um, if you, somebody has something that you're interested in, okay? Um, so uh, the hip flexor in particular is very important for how fast you can walk. Um, it, it attaches from your, the, your lumbar spine, your low back into the top of your leg and um, it basically um, bends your hip uh, beyond 90 degrees. Um, so for the exercise study, what we did was we didn't want to stress people's knees. You know, you're, if you already have weakness, the last thing we want to do is tie a band to your ankle, which is easier, but, um, but puts more stress at the knee. So we used that thigh cuff and, um, and uh, put it at the thigh. We made the hook anchor. You would want it to be underneath your thigh, and then you attach to the band um, that would be at... Um, on a leg of a table, or you can put a door anchor in a door, if, you know, uh, and, and that's what can, you can attach the bands to. So it makes it a little bit more portable. And then you pull your knee towards your chest. And the nice thing about doing it laying on your back is that you have um, support for your uh, trunk so that you're sure that you're just strengthening your hip flexor muscle and you're not um, compensating by, say, doing crunches with your, with your low back and you're putting less stress on your back. Um, uh, other, my, I think this is from my PT school, but it's like the, the hip abductor, the glute med is like if the answer to any question in any, any, any test, but it is uh, important because it keeps your pelvis stable when, you're, when you walk or when you stand, and it's the one that I talked about for balance. So it attaches from the top of your uh, pelvis to the um, top outside of your, uh, of your femur. And um, so it does something like keeps you from having the Marilyn Monroe walk. So if you pick up your hip, it doesn't drop down like this. And a lot of people with AMN have said that, you know, they're catching their toe. But when I have seen them and measured their strength, they're actually able to lift their foot. And so um, you might think that your initial reason for catching your foot is drop foot, which uh, it could very well be true, but it could also be that it just comes from your hip. And if you have weakness on one side and it lets your hip drop, it th just makes your opposite leg longer and it's easy to catch your toe when you're walking. So, um, so it could be something more simple than um, requiring, you know, a, a device to fix, to help with your lifting your toe. It could be something more working at your hip muscles to strengthen, to have better alignment to start with, and then help you clear your foot as you're walking. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that, that just speaks to Please. seeing a PT before you go in and you're thinking you're catching your toe when you actually need a hip weakness. So. Um, yeah, I think that's why that whole comprehensive uh, uh, evaluation is so important, even just as a baseline so that you know in the future if you start developing some symptoms that that gives you an opportunity to know, you know, where you were and what things, you know, might have changed. Um, so for hip abduction strengthening, uh, I prefer that you do it like this, so you're laying on your side. You can have your bottom leg bent for some stability and you keep your top legs straight, but you, uh, you're at the knee, but you turn your foot just a little bit towards the ceiling outward. Um, and then you just slide your leg out away from your body up and down. So I, I'm afraid we're not set up very well for me to lay on the floor and <laughs> show you, but, um, but you're just basically, if I do it now, I end up hip hiking. So that would be one fault that you would not want to be doing is like tilting your hip over this way. You want to be making sure that your pelvis stays nice and straight. So if this is the wall uh, that, or the floor that I'm laying on, then you're going to lift 
lift your leg to the side. Um, the other thing you don't want to see in a compensation is for it to come forward. So if you're bringing it up and you come forward, you're actually using a hip flexor muscle to compensate for that, and so you're not getting stronger. So the other technique that we do is um, have you do it where you lay on the floor but with your back against the wall so you can make sure that your shoulders, your hip, and your heel are touching the wall all at the same time, and then you make sure that your heel stays back against the wall as you raise your leg. Um, that way you're less likely to make compensations. Okay. Um, uh, so I won't go into the others. This is uh, hip extensors or your glutes, which help you stand from a chair. Uh, you can look at the video and see um, this is a way to isolate that muscle. In the gym, I think it's really hard to find a piece of equipment that does that well, um, where you're only moving at your hip and not uh, also uh, straightening like your knee out at the same time so that you would be compensating with your, with, uh, your, your quads. Um, uh, knee flexors help you bend your knee and keep your uh, knee from locking back when you're walking. Uh, so it's one where you're t uh, bending your knee to resistance. Hip external rotators are similar to the hip abductor muscle. Um, and then knee extensors, your quad, you could do as a straight leg raise. And then I'll just uh, let Chris finish uh, with uh, functional exercise. Yeah, so Jen talked about the fact that we do want to add functional exercise to your stuff and not just, you know, because when you walk, you don't just walk and use one muscle, right? You use multiple muscles. So we try to add functional exercises to the clinic as well. So we do the wall slides, which are, you know, and these are some of our higher function ex exercises that, you know, you're doing your quads and your hip extensors at the same time. You're sliding down the wall, so the wall's behind your back. If I can do it over here. You're sliding down the wall to get that squat and then you're sliding back up again. So a wall slide, and then we'll do a functional sit to stand. Again, um, when we train people to sit, who are having difficulty standing up, we tell them to lean forward and lean their nose over their toes, so you get you know, the body straight up and down. But with this one, we wanna try and stay as straight as possible when you're standing up. So you get that, you're working your core, uh, as well as you're working your, your hips and your thighs and your ankles and your feet when you're doing the exercise. So functional activity is an important way to exercise to get muscles to work together better too as well. Do you wanna advance? Yeah. So these are the references for the papers and for the Jove article, uh, if you are interested in seeing that. Um, I think in the journal you have to pay for it. Um, we had it on our website, uh, but it's not working right now, but I will work to get it back uh, available so that it's free to you. Um, and then we, of course, want to thank all of you that have participated in our studies and the lab and Kennedy who uh, have helped make our studies uh, come together. So. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So is there a way to try, like the, I've heard of the Biodes. Is there like a way to give it a try? Is there a way that you can try those devices out rather than, because I know they're expensive. Like yeah, so, so, so the, the bio, you can um, find a Binus rep in your area. If you go to the website, you can find a rep in your area, and they'll help you identify a PT clinic that either they can meet you at. Um, uh, we typically do uh, uh, a trial in the clinic one time and have the, the patient come back for a series of therapy activities, so we'll do four or five sessions in a row. Um, you really, in order to, to get the insurance company to pay for it over a brace, you really have to show it's better than the brace. So typically what I do is a six minute walk with no, nothing all on um, and do a gait quality with the video. I do a brace, six minute walk with the brace on, uh, uh, um, evaluating gait quality in the video and a six minute walk with uh, the BioNess on and do it. And then I use that, that data to report back to the insurance company improvement, so. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris and Jennifer. As, as an AMN patient, um, seeing the data was, was significant to me because a lot of times when I think a lot of patients out there are exercising, they're wondering, is, am I really doing anything? Am I really helping? And so seeing the data, I know, um, uh, was, was significant to me. Also, Chris, I had one question for you. You went over it kind of quickly, but you, you, I'm a speed you, talker. It's, 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 it's okay. It's okay. You mentioned something about casting and splinting, and there were some warnings in there, and I'd, I'd like you to see if you can elaborate on that. So typically we, uh, but it seems like by the time recently people are coming to clinic and, and catching their toe and complaining about the, the, the tripping, um, they've already reached the point of contracture. So they haven't addressed it early enough to catch that. So we see a lot of people who think they have weakness in their anterior tip and can't lift their foot up when actually their calf muscle is contracted. And then we have to splint them, which is a five-week uh, I'm sorry, cast them, which is a five-week procedure, 
um, where we wrap them up in a fiberglass cast and progressively push, aggressively push their foot up until the muscle lengthens. Or we, can, we have to splint them, which is using a, a, a splint that you pull the straps up and pull their foot up, um, and they have to sleep at night for like three months with that split on to, re, to regain their range. So the, so the, so the, uh, the important message is to, when you start feeling those issues with catching your toe, is to get that, is to bring it up sooner with your physician and address it earlier versus having to avoid the splinting and casting goes along with that. So Before I open it up to some other questions, I have another one myself. So, you know, you talked about the, the perception of exertion, making sure that you're doing something that's worthwhile. Is there any real danger in overdoing it? And can, can you actually do, do some harm? I mean, not only, I mean, you know, immediate injury, but over the long term. I, I haven't seen anybody over, get, get issues with overexercise. Um, more along the lines of uh, acute injury, I exercise to the point where I twisted an ankle or something like that, where I was tired when I exercise. So I haven't seen any do. I haven't seen people, as Jen say, um, have as much gain. So it's, a, it's that optimal window, optimal window of functioning, right? If you're functioning in that four to six, exertion level window, you're going to see gains. If you're functioning below that, that window, you know, you're not going to see gains, as Jen said. But also, if you're functioning above that window, you're not going to see the same gains because you're exercising too much and your body doesn't have time to rebuild those cells and recover. So does that make sense? Great. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Are, are there any other questions? I actually have a question from somebody who is watching online. Um, they asked, if somebody's been in a wheelchair for a long time, um, would it be possible for them to gain strength back to the point of walking? And if so, what would it take? So we, I have seen one patient do that, who was in the, uh, and that was actually the, the uh, 53 year old woman that I reported on the thing. She had come in with, in wheelchair bound and had, and had been only walking about 10 or 15 feet. Um, after the first series exercise, she got up to 170 feet in her six minute walk and then went to two, that, that 27, that 260, um, which was the next one. I'm, I'm sorry, 207, which is the next one. So, so it is possible, um, but you know, you really have to work closely with your physical therapist to, to make those changes happen. So, yeah, I would add to that. I think, um, there was, uh, someone in our curves exercise study who was in a chair who showed improvement in strength, but, um, 12 weeks is probably not very long to, you know, see a big change in, uh, you know, walking, uh, necessarily in, uh, strength. I think what we don't know too is, you know, um, how much change is due to, uh, disuse so that if you stop using something or you start walking differently, then you, you're not using certain muscles that may still, uh, have the potential to be strong and functional. Uh, so I I think that's one place to start is in just better conditioning um, and then seeing if you can progress. We don't know yet beyond that for improving strength further. So, yeah, so and just um, to, to add to that, you know, just because you're in a chair now doesn't mean you can't walk, right? So, I mean, even if you're, even if you're using the chair for long distances, it's important to stay up and moving even though you're in that chair. So, to follow up, so that person that you mentioned, the 55 or 53 year old, when they started walking more, were they walking with assistance or were they walking on their own? The, 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 so, they started off with a walker. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it was, so generally when I think she, when she started up, she had the PT working with her like short distances, five to 10 feet, you know, and with, uh, with minimal assistance. And then she moved on to, you know, walking by herself with a walker. Um, I think the important thing that she, she always pushes to, in my mind when she comes to see me is the pool, you know, the pool gave her gravity assistance that, that she couldn't get on land. So what she feels that once she got in the water and started moving, that was the thing for her, you know, just able to, to find a float device that helped her stay upright. And boy, she took off from there. So we talked about it. So. We got one right there. The mic's not working. There we go. Hi. Um, not so much a question, but just a, a, an observation uh, with my wife who has an AMN. And that is um, a few years back when she started the exercises, she uh, was suffering from, uh, as you would expect, the, 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 um, the spasticity extreme, but a lot of leg clonus as well. And so you would get that, that shaking every time that, you, you know, it became problematic. And she had exhausted all the, uh, you know, the baclofen and, and, and medical routines. So she received a baclofen pump, and I'm just sharing it works like a champ. I don't know if it's for everybody, but what it has done is, is given her the ability to do a heel toe, right? Not do the Frankenstein walk and to be able to exercise or have the capacity to do it. Um, so I'm just sharing. I still have balance issues. I still have balance issues. So when I walk, I walk with the walker to keep me steady. But you talk about how long, I was doing PT for two weeks and I saw an, an, an 
I was so happy the difference from when I started to two weeks, but then I did something to my hip and I couldn't do PT anymore. So, but two, just two weeks made a big difference with the back lift and pump, and I am truly sorry I didn't get it a long time ago. The thought of having it stick out of, sticking, like I got a bulge on my stomach. I, you know, I, I didn't I thought of, you know. But I am so sorry now because I probably would have been doing a whole lot more at this point if I'd done it a long do, time. Do people ago. know what the baclofen pump is? It's tobacco is an oral medication that generally people take for spasticity. The baclofen pump inserts a pump in, under your skin and direct doses the, the, the medication to your spine so you don't get the side effects that you get with the oral medications, tiredness and stuff like I, that. It, baclofen put me to sleep every afternoon. I could drive now. I'm out in the afternoon. I'm not tired. It's just and for what it's, it's worth, wonderful. The clonus is gone for the most part. Yeah, I just have small little bouts of the clonus. She's, her hand's been up, so that's why I want to. Um, I, I just have like a question about the baclofen pump because I've been asking my neurologist for one for a long time. I'm taking 90 milligrams of baclofen right now and I still have the tremors, um, but he doesn't know anything about it. So who, what kind of a doctor do, do I go to to actually have that done? Because I've been asking my- Any one of the physicians that are you know, neurologists come through these clinics. So MGH, Kennedy Krieger, they'll direct you and make sure you're, you're the appropriate candidate for the back pump. We do the pumps here at Kennedy. I don't know if you guys also do them up there at MGH, but any one of these clinics, they can, any of these neurologists can. Pittsburgh does them, you know, I think Children's Hospital, actually Children's Hospital doesn't see adults, but they see children and do the pumps there, so. Wonderful, thank you. My son has um, cerebral ALD. He was diagnosed at six. I think by the time he's had, I just want to say that he's had five pumps and the life of the battery gets longer each new pump, but it's like a little hockey puck. Um, right in here with the catheter that goes into his spinal fluid because the baclofen that he needed to keep his feet in his foot rests and his arms up here, he was burning so many calories. So, and although it cuts off here, so it's not affecting your breathing and other things like that, it did have a trickle up effect and it relaxed his arms as well. Um, and so he's had several replacements and survived them nicely, but, um, a neurosurgeon puts them in, and then Brian's is maintained by a physiatrist across between a orthopedic surgeon and a physical and a and a non-operating doctor. Phys physical medicine yeah. rehabilitation doctor. Yes. Yeah, so and yeah. uh, we make the trip like every 90 days, and it's Brian can even sleep through it. He just puts a template on, takes the leftover medicine out, puts it in. So I highly recommend it to. Your boys, if you're here for your boys, women, men, it's wonderful. Um, there's a lot of people watching online today. Um, so if you could uh, quickly speak to how the Botox injection works. Someone was wondering. So the Botox injection is a, is a, box, a botulism toxin that's injected directly into the muscle. Um, and it's, uh, it, actually, um, it actually degrades the nerve in that particular muscle, so that muscle becomes weak and cannot produce as much uh, force. Um, so generally what that does is, uh, the idea behind it is, is you reduce the activity of the overactive spastic muscle, and then myself as a physical therapist can strengthen the muscles around it so that they can balance them and weaken them up. So if you're going to get Botox injections or have Botox injections done, we do recommend you see physical therapy after that for a, a more intensive bout to actually, you know, counteract that effect of that, of that muscle, of that uh, degradation of the nerve. So, so if I inject the calf muscle, then I won't be able to push my toe down as hard um, and the spasticity won't, spasticity won't kick in as well. So. Um, hi, I got a pediatric question. Um, actually, two points. Uh, one is my son gets uh, PT in school. 
and obviously the PT teachers has to do everything within what he does in school. And he's been having PT for the last uh, six years. And their goal is for him, um, he has depth perception as well as weakness on his left side. The goal is for to carry three books and open the door and walk down the stairs. And I'm blue in the face, tell him that it's never going to happen. I never want to see my son on the top of the stairs when he has to reach to figure out how to step down. And holding books, he can't even open the door with both hands, let alone one hand. So we're continuously, if there's anything that you could recommend that I could like put in the IEP for him to get something better than what they're doing because it's not helping. Do, do, do you want to talk afterwards? It, sure. Uh, so we can talk more directly about the IEP and what his goals are and tell me a little bit about his function yeah. and I can, and I can maybe talk through some strategies that you can that actually would be do, wonderful. do for the school. A people. second part, sorry. Yeah, just, just, sorry, just to pause that for a second, just so people know that school, and that school is a related service and it's a related to function, so we have to address the IEP for functional activities that, that are happening at school, but we can talk about that. But yeah, you really have to focus around, they're really focused on, PTs uh, focus on school related activities yes. when they do it, yeah, so. Um, the other thing is that, um, the weakness on his left side from um, going to transplant and having progression. Um, it was, his foot was turning in really bad and they put a brace on it and it was on for a year and a half. We felt it wasn't doing anything, if anything it was making things work. And he was to go back. They thought maybe they put um, the one from the ankle up to the knee, um, but that would limit and it would atrophy as well. We weren't too happy with that. Um, so um, he was to go back and get his shoes and get the uh, bigger shoes. And we decided to get him basketball sneakers in between. The high tops. The high tops with a strap across it. And it's doing wonders mm -hmm. for him. It's absolutely, he's walking better. And um, I'm so glad that we didn't. We, they did tell us that, well, they'll loosen up, but we'll just get him a new pair like a kind of a rigid pair, one of them at least rigid, to keep his foot straight rather than turning in and, you know, walking into him. Yeah, people. A, a lot of times the, the rotation that occurs in a foot actually occurs at the hip and not the ankle and the foot. So people think they try to address it with a foot brace, but that doesn't directly attract it. It's actually the hip is where that rotation occurs. So depending on if, if that rotation at the hip, the brace is not going to make much of a difference to that. Um, you can try other options as far as like wedging under the shoe to get, you know, there's a saying that when the foot hits the ground, everything changes. So when the foot hits the ground, it actually causes a rotation on your hip and can counteract that motion. So we can talk about that as well, too, if you want to talk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there have been uh, It's blue. So there have been a, a, a lot of wonderful questions, and I'm sure many of you have some more questions. Maybe if I could ask maybe you two to stick around a little bit, maybe feel some of those questions, it'd be great. Because um, I want to...